The Crouching Tiger interviews David Lampton from A to She. Right now, I think Asia is one of the more unstable uh, geopolitically central places in the world. You have competing nationalism between China and Japan, Korea and Japan, India and Japan. So while this isn't the general perception, it is a volatile area in which people are basically strategically distrustful of each other. So we have this huge economic state in this uh, marginal, this fragile uh, security a circumstance. And historically, and I think currently, the United States has tried to play a stabilizing role. I think that's essential. So how can we play that stabilizing role, uh, deter conflict among these potentially competing countries, and at the same time uh, maintain uh, uh, our economic advantage in the, the region? I think that's essentially the geopolitical problem. As a key part of coping with that problem, Professor Lampton sees a compelling need to redirect America's focus on domestic issues after more than a decade of war and economic stagnation. I think Americans would say since 9-11, uh, we've been terribly engaged in a draining conflicts that have produced relatively little for our national interest. Uh, they see our manufacturing job population going down, the middle class is eroding, and frankly, they are right to put the focus on our, our domestic development. And if foreign presence has to play, pay a price for that, I think in general they're willing to have that price paid. And, and there's much to recommend that point of view. Professor Lampton is not, however, a neo-isolationist. Instead, he wants to take a page out of China's own strategic playbook and focus this country on building what the Chinese call comprehensive national power. My view would be that the comprehensive national power of the United States, the quality of our human resources, the quality of our infrastructure, the quality of our K through 12 education, the quality of our research and development, these are the bases of power. When we are healthy along those dimensions, the Chinese, I think, stand up and pay attention. If we're declining in terms of our comprehensive national power and our national capabilities in these ways, I think basically the Chinese are going to be more difficult to deal with. So I think we may be at a point in our history where we relatively have to pay more attention to our domestic circumstance, create the long-term basis for renewed American power, and we'll be more effective. I I do fear, as many Americans do, that we will overinvest on the military front, we'll create enemies, we'll create uh, the destabilization we're trying to prevent, and in the process we'll weaken ourselves economically and intellectually. So I think the, the American instinct, not to retreat from the world, but to pay relatively more attention to solving our own problems rather than solving everybody else's problems, which we in, an, in the end rarely do in any event, uh, is the right instinct. So I'm, I'm, I'm with the American people as I would understand their views on this. One of Professor Lampton's biggest concerns is that of a classic arms race in Asia catalyzed by the reactions of America and its allies to China's own military rise. Here he examines the possible pitfalls of an American dispersal strategy of its Asian bases and a concomitant action-reaction cycle. There are experts who say, as essentially, as our forces become more vulnerable to power projection systems that the PRC has or is developing, we need to disperse our forces to make them less vulnerable. So it might be smaller uh, concentrations of U.S. forces more widely dispersed on the region. Uh, of course, this then creates a whole set of problems of their own, because wherever you have U.S. forces or foreign forces in a country, you have a whole set of problems dealing with the local population and local governments. That's a problem. We got thrown out of the Philippines in the early 1990s, so we've been around that track with the Filipinos. The Vietnamese are careful. They want us there, but in a very low-key way, same in Singapore and so forth. So there is some uh, merit to this dispersion of forces, but don't underestimate the problems that that also uh, brings. I'd say that's the first thing. But the more troubling aspect of this is, of course, if we would react and do things, and the Chinese wouldn't react and it all stopped there, that would be fine. 
But the Chinese are going to react, and they're going to take measures to deal with that. It may be proliferate the number of missiles so they can strike more dispersed forces, in which case we'll be reacting to that. So what we have is what I would call an action reaction cycle that it leads us to ever higher expenditures, ever higher concentrations of force and lethality, and we all end up at greater cost with less security. So it seems to me the intelligent policy is how do we not get on this treadmill? Here, Professor Lampton reflects on the difficulty of negotiating with the Chinese, a difficulty deeply rooted not just in China's so-called century of humiliation, but also in our own narrative of American exceptionalism. Every country has its narrative, and our respective narratives about our own history, our own values, our own sense of ourselves differs, but it, it shapes our behavior deeply. And the Chinese are, uh, have a narrative, and that narrative, uh, I, I did 558 interviews uh, with Chinese leaders over the last 40 years. And the word that keeps appearing in Chinese rhetoric is, we've been bullied. We are the nation that has been bullied, pushed around, humiliated. And this does make the Chinese very prickly to deal with and to see uh, malintentions where we may not, in our own prop uh, proposals to the Chinese, see that. I'll be the first to say it's not necessarily easy from an American point of view to have dialogue and mutual understanding with the Chinese. But I think there are some people who say, well, therefore, you really can't uh, trust or make progress through dialogue because this narrative that the Chinese have is so obstructing. Uh, and I think that's demonstrably not true. So I think we need to avoid a, a, a sort of a polarized discussion. You either can talk to the Chinese or you can't. I would say you can, but it's difficult. And that, therefore, we've got to persist. And remember, America has its narrative, too. We're the indispensable nation. We're the, the exceptional nation. We alone have a responsibility to lead in the world. And of course, this leads us to a rather assertive posture, particularly on political issues around the world. So if the, you were talking to a Chinese, they would say the American narrative isn't so easy to get along with either. One of the biggest obstacles to peace may well be the polar opposite approaches that China and the U.S. take towards deterrence. Well, I think this idea about how do you get deterrence, Americans and Chinese, I believe, think about this differently, and it creates a huge problem. I think the United States, because we've been the preeminent military power in the world for since World War II, uh, basically thinks you deter by showing your capability and making it clear to the opponent that they cannot prevail and the cost of trying is going to be so high they're, not, they're going to decide it's not even worth going down that road. And you can look at U.S. policy, whether it's our naval presence, our space presence. Uh, dominance is a key aspect of this. Now, of course, when we are dominant, we feel secure. The problem is when we're dominant, others may feel insecure. And so how you find a stable point of, of balance when one wants to be absolutely dominant, there is no equilibrium point if the other person wants to feel secure. So there is a problem. Now, the Chinese look at deterrence. They've usually been the weaker party. And therefore, the, how they try to deter is to keep the opponent uncertain of what they have obfuscate the situation, obfuscate your, your capabilities. So we have us believing clarity and capability leads to deterrence. There they think obscurity and, uh, and non-transparency uh, will deter us because we're not sure what China can do or what China would do or how China would react. So I think there is this, but I think there's one thing that's changing, and that is as China is becoming stronger, which I think we all will agree China is becoming stronger, it is moving towards that position of, of more confidence in its own capabilities and therefore more willing, I believe, to show its capabilities. But this is a gradual, you know, the weak fear transparency and the strong flout their power. While we complain about the difficulty of dealing with the Chinese government, Professor Lampton points out American democracy is no bed of roses either when it comes to negotiations. I remember back when Deng Xiaoping visited the United States in 
February of 1979, uh, he got a briefing on the U.S. government and checks and balances and our federal system and the courts and all of that. And he, ex he expressed to President Carter the following sentiment. He says, Mr. President, how many governments do you have? Here, Professor Lampton laments the use of bogeymen in the political arena to justify increased defense budgets in both China and the U.S. Well, I think it's naive to think that in either society there aren't constituencies that favor more military spending. And if you're going to justify more military spending, you have to have a plausible threat of a scale. Uh, and in a sense, you can say after the Cold War, uh, China's the last man standing in terms of big big powers that could conceivably across a broad range of national power threaten us. So I think almost by default, China has become a, a, a ploy in budgetary politics. But quite frankly, the same thing is going on in China. As for China's President Xi Jinping, Professor Lampton is concerned Xi may be setting himself up for a very hard fall. It's been impressive the degree to which he has consolidated his power over the military and over the key nodes of policy making that control various parts of the financial system, the economic reform system, the military system, the crisis management system. So at this point, he looks like he's going to be a strong leader. Uh, I guess I'm a little off the consensus, uh, maybe, of American people who pay attention to China in, in detail, because I think he may be overreaching. He's trying to eliminate very important power factions in the elite, and it's not clear that, to me, he won't threaten a lot of very important political actors and pay a price for that. We'll, we'll see about that. One of the traps Professor Lampton is worried that President Xi will fall into is that of nationalism, a clear case of playing with fire. The problem in Asia is uh, nationalism is on the rise in many places, not least China. And that Xi Jinping is sort of hooking his cart to the, um, the horse team of nationalism and trying to increase his own legitimacy by appealing to the deeply felt resentment, particularly of Japan, uh, but secondarily uh, the United States and uh, some of its neighbors. So you're kind of unleashing a, an aggressive impulse here that you may not yourself be able to satisfy. And we've already seen anti-Japanese nationalism spill out into the destruction of Japanese property, uh, intimidating overseas nationals who may be in China at any given moment. It gets ugly very fast. So I think this is a plane uh, with, with fire. As a longtime observer of China, Professor Lampton seems both puzzled and disappointed with China's abandonment of its peaceful rise in recent times. I think China has made a tremendous strategic error, and you could identify it maybe 2008, 2009, certainly by 2010, everybody would agree this trend towards more Chinese assertiveness has been apparent. And I, I think it was... Uh, bordering on a strategic blunder because the story of China's reform from 1977 when Deng came back to I think about 2008 was China's comprehensive national power growing at a very steep gradient. And if you had a line also on that graph of how anxious were China's neighbors or even the United States and other bigger powers, that line of increasing threat would be much uh, shallower. In other words, China managed to grow its power without correspondingly increasing the worry and sense of threat up until about 2008. And then for reasons that we're still trying to understand, China began to act in a much less reassuring, that's the diplomatic way of putting it, or threatening uh, a way. And therefore, China's neighbors have begun to do two things. One is acquire their own military capabilities to more adequately defend themselves. And so you're seeing an incipient, if not actual, arms race occurring in the region. And they're all trying to crowd under the U.S. security uh, umbrella uh, to get more deter U.S. deterrence against China as it deals with its neighbors. And this is profoundly not in China's interest because China has an enormous domestic agenda that its, its, its own external actions are diverting uh, the, the capacity to focus on those because of this external challenge. 
So I think uh, to the degree uh, that China is not reassuring its neighbors is a huge problem for China's own uh, development. My mother used to say, you never have a second opportunity to make a first impression. And uh, in fact, I think the Chinese assertive policy uh, is what many of China's neighbors actually hidden uh, under the surface feared would become China's policy. And some ill-chosen remarks and actions by China have, uh, in fact, I think, made many of its neighbors, smaller neighbors, think, uh, now, now we've seen the real China here. Uh, and so I think China's got a big problem in overcoming this. Here, Professor Lampton is on the same page as many of the experts I spoke to. That is, weakening America's Asian alliances would be highly destabilizing for the region. However, Professor Lampton also acknowledges weaknesses in the current alliance structure and openly wonders how we can bring China into the tent rather than create an us-against-China enemy. If the United States precipitously weakened or uh, disassociated itself from its five alliances in Asia, Japan and Korea, Thailand, uh, Australia, and the Philippines, uh, this would be very destabilizing and either force those countries to acquire their own deterrent, which quite conceivably in some cases could mean nuclear weapons, and that would be totally contrary to our counter-proliferation policy, or it would lead the nations in the region to conclude they need to accommodate to China and go along with China on issues, economic and otherwise, that would be harmful to us. So precipitous uh, disassociation from our alliances, I think, would be catastrophic. But I think you have to ask a further question, and that is, how are we going to eventually have security in Asia if the structure of the security apparatus is China's neighbors allied with the U.S. Uh, against China? That's not a stable structure either. So I think we have to, at the same time, we are very careful how we treat our alliances and preserve them. We have to think about how we build a new security structure, maybe several security structures, that have China inside. It is not, to me, credible to think that a security structure that has China on the outside, as important and powerful as it is, is going to be a stable structure there. So yes, I think we have to, the problem is how do we get from the world we created in, after World War II and the Cold War, how do we get to a new security structure where the Chinese feel invested in it rather than alienated from it. Now, it's easy to propose that that's the problem. It's not so easy to say how you get there uh, there from here. But I think that's the challenge. If we uh, think our security lies in a structure that freezes out China and makes it the explicit opponent, I think you're going to get just progressively worse behavior from China. To Lampton, the hope is that such worse behavior doesn't end in a nuclear war, and he urges great caution. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with an opponent as big as China, you, have, you just can't run up the escalatory ladder because with China, it ends with nuclear weapons, that escalatory ladder. And this is why you don't want to get a conflict with China, because it gives you nothing but bad choices. On China's nine-dash line claim to much of the South China Sea, Professor Lampton sees this simply as a political quagmire for China. I think the nine-dash line is a, um, is a millstone, really, around the neck of the Chinese. It goes almost down to Indonesia. It really would make the uh, South China Sea a Chinese lake if those were to be the territorial waters of China, not acceptable to the United States, not a, a, acceptable to any of the states around the South China Sea. So uh, it's really a line that the Chinese communists inherited from the Guomindang, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, and they don't want to be less steadfast defenders of Chinese sovereignty than Chiang Kai-shek was. So in a sense, part of the story is they've inherited a line they now have to defend, even though the world's a rather different place. But I think overall, China is making more enemies in the end, according to international law, I think doesn't have a good case. And so I would think that the best part of wisdom for China would be to negotiate this issue with its neighbors, uh, cut an equitable deal, sign a code of conduct, and move on. This is just a millstone around China's neck. As for how America and its allies should respond to China's aggression, he acknowledges the difficulties 
but hopes for the best in China. I think this whole question of how one responds to what you might call Chinese salami tactics in the South China Sea, you just sort of peel off one piece of atoll or one atoll after the next, and pretty soon you've you've got yourself a set of facts that mirror this nine-dash line, and you, in the end, possession is nine-tenths of the law, and so you've, you've actually presented the world with a set of fait accomplis about which you don't any longer feel you have to negotiate. Uh, and I think that's, quite frankly, probably the strategy China's pursuing. It's a, a strategy difficult for us because, in effect, many of these atolls are not a uh, a national interest of the United States. But on the other hand, you don't want to reward this kind of, of tactic. My hope would be that the Chinese would see that they have a larger problem, and that is they will have no peace with their neighbors. They will not be able to focus on their internal development as long as they keep intimidating their neighbors. So I guess part of my hope is that the Chinese recognize that what I believe is their own interest and begin to act accordingly. If they don't, they're going to face a bigger military buildup by all its neighbors, the United States. They're going to find a more assertive Japan, and that's not going to be a world the Chinese like. We ended the interview with this grim assessment of why North Korea is highly unlikely to give up its nuclear weapons. Nuclear capability is their ultimate insurance policy because when all is said and done, the United States and its allies have never attacked a nuclear power. And when Libya gave up its nuclear program, it went down the hill. And so it just be my judgment that North Korea is not going to get rid of this because the regime, this is both their insurance policy uh, and it's their legitimacy with their own people, in a sense, that it, despite all the privation, we're a strong country. They lose this, the Communist Party in North Korea is gone. So I think that that's a death sentence for the, China, uh, the North Korean leaders. And so they're going down the nuclear route, and my guess is nothing can divert them, uh, that we're going to have to, unfortunately, deal with that reality. Right.